Hey, everyone. This is the Best Places podcast, and this week we're going to explore climate change. We've got the team here. We're going to talk about it, and uh, we're going to share what's happening here in Portland, uh, which is having its own problems. But let's jump right into it. And we've got Nick Arnold with us. Uh, we have Bertrand Sperling and Al Olson. And um, guys, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, each one of your your background and and uh, and uh, so everybody knows who you are and what you do. Hey, everybody. I'm Nick. Uh, as Bert mentioned, I'm the, geo, the chief geospatial analyst uh, over at Best Places, but I'm also uh, a guy with a pretty good amount of experience in climatology. Uh, so I'm hoping to provide plenty of insight today for our climate discussion. I'm Al Olson, uh, CTO at Best Places. I'm looking forward to this topic. I, uh, I live in the country and Climate change affects a lot of people out here in the country, and it's nice to uh, talk about topics that I can relate to out here. Great. Uh, I'm Bertrand Sperling. I'm the COO. I do research, product development, writing, uh, PR, stuff like that. And I have a little bit of background in climatology, just a, a smidgen. Uh, I went during high school, I spent a couple of weeks at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in College Park, Maryland. And we looked at um, basically how the climate was shifting over the over the time of like from ice age to ice age. And, and actually that was back in the 90s and climate change was being talked about back then. So I'm interested to see what's new uh, as far as what people are finding and how the discussion is, has changed or evolved, stuff like that with all the changes we're seeing. Great, <clears throat> and I'm Bert Sperling and I um, formed uh, Best Places way back about 30 years ago. Uh, so it's been exciting to see how this has evolved. And uh, we're going to be talking about these things. And we have a great team with us today. So, but hey, most of all, I would love for you to check in with us via email uh, or, or give us a phone call, whatever. And tell us what's happening where you live and share it with everyone. Uh, when you're watching this, you can write in the comments uh, and uh, you can tell us about what's going on where you are because no one knows your place like you do. You're the expert when it comes to you and where you live. So let's jump right into it. Now, Nick went ahead and talked about his background. You, Nick, you actually grew up like storm chasing and your uh, it's in the family. You know, you have it in your blood. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a geographer at heart, and that kind of came naturally because my, uh, my dad is a geographer, more specifically meteorology and climatology. So, you know, not only did I study it in school on my own, but I've been around climatology and meteorology as Bert mentioned, storm chasing for basically my entire life. I was doing that as a, literally a six-year-old, uh, just spending a month in a van traveling around the country, you know, chasing tornadoes uh, with my parents and a group of college students at various universities. So if you've seen some storm chasers on TV, I probably was on one of those trips back in the early 90s at some point in time. <laughs> so to that end, I, I like I said, I know quite a bit about climate. Um, I, I as a geographer in general, I understand a lot of the uh, the nuances with climate and how it affects various places. Um, right now, for example, you know, in the West, we're experiencing mega drought and massive fires and everything related to heat and the absence of water. And if you're out east, there's a good chance that you know this year, up to date, you've experienced quite a bit of flooding in some cases. So. You're all feeling it, we're all feeling it, but we're all feeling it in different ways. And that's kind of the essence of climate change is really that things are more extreme, things are more erratic. It's not necessarily drier or wetter or colder or warmer. It's all of those things more extreme than you experience. And that's kind of how it sort of manifests in these extreme weather events we're experiencing right now. So it's, it's an interesting concept, you know, here just talking about climate because we can all feel it in different ways. But I think if you ask the poll of people today, it's getting harder and harder to say it's not a thing, right? Everybody's feeling it in the various ways, and it's a pretty convincing <laughs> argument just experiencing it to, to truly say that, you know, climate change is, or, is a real thing. So here at Best Places, it's all about the comparison of places and, and what are the best places. Are there any 
are there any places in the U.S. that are um, doing better right now because of climate change? I mean, here in the Pacific Northwest, we could always count on amazingly beautiful summers and uh, mild temperatures through most of the year. Uh, and it's been it, it's been brutal. It's not a it's not one of the best places for summer this year or last year. So, are there any places uh, around the U.S. that are are doing better? Uh, lately? Uh, it depends how you define better. You know, some people have this concept in their heads that, well, climate change can be a good thing. You know, if you're thinking about it from a resource perspective, if your winters are shorter, in theory, that gives you more of an opportunity to grow crops and food that you might need to depend on. Um, so it depends how you view it. Honestly, I would say that generally speaking, at least this summer, you know, the Midwest, for example, has been typically the most, in theory, well off, but there have been some rather extreme rain events uh, this season as well. And they're, you know, they're they're coming off basically lots and lots and lots of rain and lots of humidity because of all that extra rain. But they're actually in the coming weeks about to experience a heck of a heat wave themselves, which will probably come with a lack of rain. So there's not really not anywhere you can escape it. To be honest, in the Midwest, you bounce between flood and drought in Florida, you're dealing with, you know, lots of rain, lots of things like that, lots of heat. Um, you know, you experience a lot of thunderstorms in the South in general, but you get those more frequently and with more bang when they do arrive. You know, in Southern California, you're subject to fires. In Oregon, we're subject to fires. In the Northwest, you're subject to fires everywhere else. You know, in the Intermountain West, you're subject to fires. And if you're in New York City today or yesterday or this week at all, you've seen a whole lot of smoke that's just making your life maybe a little bit different than you're used to experiencing. And that's, you know, it's a closed system, the earth. So it's hard to be in any one place and say you're truly like not going to experience climate <clears throat> change because in that closed system, you're kind of always affected in a way that maybe you didn't think about, but you're affected. So uh, just to, before we... Uh, go on to Bertrand or Al for, for their take. Uh, the smoke in New York City, where's that from? Most of it is from uh, the biggest fire in the West right now, which is the bootleg fire in Southern Oregon. Uh, but to be honest with you, there's a lot of other fires that have sparked up recently in California and other states. So, I mean, literally these plumes of clouds are traveling from the far West Coast, making it all the way to the East Coast. And in, in reality, like if these things go along, they can totally circle the globe and affect, you know, they can create hazy conditions in China, you know, wow. essentially the other side of the planet um, in this wow. in this world. And I, I think I heard that the on the Oregon coast, uh, there was uh, some haziness and some cloudiness from fires in Russia that were going across the Pacific. So it's always something. Yep. Um so, uh, like Al Bertrand, what do you, what have you get, what have you folks been hearing? Well, re we're recently uh, where we're at. We had a record-setting uh, heat. You know, a couple of days there uh, went up to what 116, or was that about what it was? And yep. So we have uh, some animals actually on our property that uh, died from the heat, which they couldn't. You know, they couldn't get out of the heat um and so there's uh also uh an increase you know on the flip side to you know i've noticed that there's a lot uh it used to be years where there wasn't snow in the pacific northwest but it seems like every year now it's snowing so the extremes are getting more extreme and you know there's uh there's solutions to uh, you know, all this uh, water shortage that's going on. But, you know, I was reading up on uh, on the internet about a, you know, specifically with the Colorado River, there's in Arizona, there's like a 20 year drought down there. And in Arizona, they're having starting next year cutbacks on water. And in the central Arizona, they're going to start cutting off water to a lot of these farmers. So it, it's really going to start having an impact on our society. I think if this continues, it's going to be the tip of the iceberg of what 
is about to happen universally within our society as a whole. And this could uh, affect uh, our, our food supply. Um, and, you know, potentially we could see migration of people out of certain areas as the water shortage continues. Yeah. Yeah. There totally. could be, there could be a geopolitical unrest too, as certain countries mm-hmm. become more powerful as far as their uh, ability to grow crops and stuff like that. Like Canada might become more uh, apt for growing certain crops and same with Northern Russia, which were those areas of the globe are traditionally covered over with ice, but they might look more like what our fertile, perfect croplands were like in America if everything kind of gets pushed north. Yeah, good, yeah very mean, good you, point. You're also kind of hitting on another another point, guys, that is, it's, I mean, it, it is climate change related, but we're talking about needing to limit water to farms in Arizona. And it's the same situation in California, right? Like if you buy if you buy iceberg lettuce in January anywhere in this country, there's like a 99% chance it was grown in Southern California in the desert, right? So we spend lots and lots of land area in the Southwest where it doesn't rain reliably. And we remove all the water from the Colorado River so we can grow balls of water. <laughs> Literally. I mean, iceberg lettuce is 90% water. So we want to grow balls of water in a desert. And so it's a land use issue as well. It's not just climate change. It's that as a population, we're growing, we need more food, they plant more food. God forbid you run into a drought and you have problems because you shouldn't have been growing food there in the first place. <laughs> yeah, sand. That's, right, it's, inc- that's it's incredibly wa- wasteful in other words. It, it requires a lot of resources and, and just to, to, All the to new- do that, it's like, yeah. Yeah, news <laughs> articles are, are talking about, you know, how Lake Mead will never refill. Well, it's, you know, we've been talking about the quote, bathtub ring, unquote, uh, at Lake Powell for years and years and years, decades, in fact. It was, a, it was an environmental issue brought up when I was in college 15 years ago, and it had already been an issue for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And it's ne- it hasn't filled since 2001. It's been 20 years, as Al mentioned, it's about a 20-year drought. And you need a lot of rain right now to fill that. And there's a good chance it may never truly fill because we divert so much of it away so quickly for those balls of lettuce and for water to the L.A. basin and to Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, I don't know why anybody would want to live in Phoenix. Eight million people that don't have water and it's 120 <laughs> degrees. No, <laughs> just just no. <laughs> yeah, nature's 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 telling you something when it's, when it's right. that hot. We're if uh, if any of our viewers want to tell Nick why 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 he should live in in Phoenix, let us know. <laughs> if we have any, yeah, if we have any uh, satisfied Phoenix residents, uh, please let us know because we'd like to hear the other. So, uh, can I just clarify the, us for the room or for the discussion? Now, are we talking about? I assume that we're ta- uh, talking about anthropogenic climate change uh, in this during this whole topic, right? Where human ki- human humankind caused human caused climate change, right? Because there's 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 little yeah. there's little discrep there's little dispute that the climate has been changing recently, but kind of the political or the the other thing is how much of of this is is man man made climate change. well. Unless, does it make you know that this this comes around to a very good um, point? Does it matter what's causing it? I mean, whether it's man-made or not. Uh, oh, but we need we need somebody to blame, don't we? Like that's that's our <laughs> shtick. Is is we need to blame somebody? Yeah, yeah. If for political reasons, if no other. But right. you know, I, I wonder. You know, when people say, "Well, we didn't cause it," yeah, but it's happening. So we have to react to it regardless of where it came from. Uh, so, you know, whether it's it's man-made or not, I don't always understand why that's important. Right. Any, any thoughts, yeah. anyone? Yeah, I have a thought on this because our, um, our, our family, uh, we've had a, a large farm for years and years. And if you think back to... Uh, when this, when this country was formed, we started tilling the ground. And then we ran into those dust bowls where all the soil was brought up into the air, choked out people. Um, and then the sun hit the open dirt and it dried up all the, the soil. And so 
one of the things that we've we're you know science is starting to learn is that it's really not a good practice to till the earth and leave, leave a, a ground cover when you're growing crops and that's actually one of the top um, items for you know air pollution when you get all the dust out there and and it also has a lot to do with water conservation and um, specifically on our family farm we used to have open ditches where with canals and the water would run out so by law the county said well you can't have open ditches anymore so we had to put all the water into pipes which conserved quite a bit of water just in doing that and so i think the the tilling uh is a less talk it's talked about a lot less in the media and everywhere else but i think it's one of our biggest causes of this water shortage because if we're growing meat we have to have hay and alfalfa and all these other crops to support meat production, which takes a lot of water out of the environment. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll stop there if anyone wants to continue along those veins. Al, you're, uh, I, you know, I was thinking about this conversation we were going to have today on the pod and the first thing that came to mind was that we're on the verge of repeating the Dust Bowl. And mm -hmm. that's exactly to your specific point, because we've learned this lesson before, have we not? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, at least I learned about the Dust Bowl, but it doesn't seem like a lot of people that are in charge have like kind of learned from that in the last 80 or so 100 years now. So it's, it's just an interesting idea that we're just repeating patterns that are essentially unsustainable long term. Um, so, so, Nick, uh, right. just to circle back to what Al said and that you're you're um, uh, also hitting on, um, we could actually have another Dust Bowl. I mean, I, I don't think the uh, the resource extraction, the removal of grass and the tilling is so ridiculous in any specific spot to create like a literal dust bowl again. But in conjunction with these droughts, I th frankly, I think anything's kind of on the table. I mean, that's exactly what caused the dust bowl was that they were tilling and they had all this lovely water that was coming reliably. And then suddenly you hit a drought and then suddenly it persists for a decade or two. And then you have stuff like that. I assume we would be smart enough to uh, recognize those things before they happen, but you know we're heading down a few trajectories that make me think that that's it's a possibility in some places, at least on a local scale. But to Al's point, you know, it is a, a big waste of water. You know, if you don't have plants on the surface, it's just running off, and the drier the earth gets, the longer it takes for the water to actually like infiltrate the soil. And so if you're in Oregon or if you're in California and you have Xeric clay soils, soils, excuse me, it means that in the summertime, they're dry and hard as a rock. Like you just, it takes a lot of effort to dig through there. If you know what, what I'm referring to with Xeric clay, clay soil, if you have that in the wintertime, it soaks up a lot of stuff and it can be great. But again, it dries out. So if you're in a drought, it's just going to run off, causing more problems. It's not going to hold it. It's not going to recharge aquifers. It's just a runoff situation. Uh, and there's a whole host of yeah. issues that can come from that too, you know? So we have to, I mean, as a country, we have to be better with dealing with water. It ain't going to happen. We're just not going to be better about that. There's entirely too many people involved, like the 8 million or so I refer, referred to in Phoenix and the 20 million in LA or whatever it is. It is what it is. You know, uh, yeah. it's just a, it's a problem. Not going to be. Yeah, what, what we're also finding is that by, doing this no-till on a lot of farms they're actually increasing food production mm -hmm. we're holding the groundwater and one of the things that is not really talked about is that when you keep tilling you have to keep putting fertilizer down which yep. does pollute the environment it contaminates your groundwater and over time these soils just become uh, barren you just really can't grow anything over you know a 20, 30, 40, 50 year period, if you're not rotating crops and if you know by that tilling, it just continually takes stuff out of the soil. And, and it, Al, it really does have an impact on climate change. 
Mm-hmm. Al, for us, uh, for us non-farmers, I don't understand. You said non-tilling, but I always thought you had to till the ground to plant the seeds uh, to get them. How do you get? How do you get the seeds to grow if you're not digging up the soil to do that? Well, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm not a farmer, but I'm no expert. But when they talk about no tilling, what they're talking about is you can make small slices in the earth Mm -hmm. and not take out all of the ground cover. So uh, you have to have a mixture of different kinds of plants on the ground when you don't till. And it takes care of uh, pest control and so. So basically, you can grow your crop organically. Okay, cool. Hey, before we do anything else, let's uh, pay the rent, so to speak, or, and because we are uh, best places, let's look at the, the whole country, maybe by region, and look at how, how they're doing and uh, as far as climate change and what might um be coming up on the horizon what people are saying so let's say let's say we start around the south and florida um maybe texas uh you know the south we'll start there and what are we looking at anybody have any uh thoughts about uh how climate change change is affecting that region yeah so uh, essentially um any any type of heat in the southeast any extra heat you have means that you can put more moisture in the atmosphere. So I know that I've spoken to people in the Midwest that have experienced increased humidity over the years, and I expect that to be kind of the same thing. Although I, it's already so humid in the South, I'm not sure you could even tell anymore, to be honest with you. But it, it, it should be more humid. you know. And with that extra humidity, there's more energy available for thunderstorms and things of that nature. So you know, I would expect... Hurricanes. <laughs> a hotter, stormier experience, hurricanes as well. Yeah. Although that has probably a little more to do with global circulation than specifically the region, but they would very likely experience many more hurricanes than normal. Yeah. And how about uh, sea level rise? Uh, what's, what's, what is the highest place in Florida? What, 111 feet high or something like that? Pro- probably some, some sand dune in the middle of the state somewhere, most likely. Yeah. I've heard it. Uh, uh, I've heard it said that the highest place in Florida is actually, if you include man-made uh, areas or whatever, it's a garbage dump uh, some somewhere <laughs> in, in the middle of the state. Yeah. Um, but I, I lived in uh, Key West for a while uh, growing up, and uh, it was uh, amazing. Of course, I was only like, what, 12 years old at the time and, and uh, spent my time skin diving and that sort of thing, uh, snorkeling. Uh, but uh, it was amazing. But in Miami and other areas, the sea level rise, uh, they have uh, a lot of plumbing uh, internally that, and drains. So when the king tides come up, the uh, unusually high tides, uh, there's a place for the water to drain back down again. You know, to me, it seems like uh, there's a lot of um, uh, two sort of ways of thinking that haven't really gotten together. At one at one level, the uh, the uh, the the mayor of Miami says, "Come on over, everybody! All you uh, all you folks, uh, uh, California doesn't want you. They're tax- taxing you too high. Come on over to Miami, and uh, we have a great tech scene and everything. It's going to be wonderful." But on the other hand, the sea level is rising. Uh, they're talking about a, a, a seawall of twenty feet high uh, <laughs> going uh, through the city uh, to try and protect it. Um, and of course the mayor doesn't want to talk about that, but it's almost like on one hand, we're ignoring it as long as we can. And on the other hand, we have the, the evidence that keeps mounting and at some point they're going to have to come together. Yeah. I saw some maps that by 2050, uh, a lot of land mass over in that area is going to be underwater. So, you know, how can we ignore that? Yeah. Now, is that from that's from the glacier melting on the poles and then increasing overall sea level? Is that mainly what that is from? There are actually a, a number of different things. Um, one that people tend to focus on is, yeah, glaciers melting, adding seawater, resulting in sea level rise. And that's a, that's clearly an issue for pretty much most eastern seaboard cities. Like in New York, is is very affected as well because. They're all at like three feet 
above sea level, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, most, most of the populated areas in and around Florida are, are, are just like that. And as a matter of fact, it's sort of like there's multiple things at work here because people might recall recently there was this article that came out a number of different places referring to the moon wobbling and having increased tides because of that, because as people probably know, tides are all driven by moon phase and things of that nature. So the moon is on this interesting little wobble now, which scientists are predicting should create uh, significantly higher swells than normal in the coming years. So it's not just glaciers melting. There's things like that that are odd that can happen. But there's also another factor here is that Florida, people think it's fine because it rains a lot, so you won't run out of water, but they have massive problems with saltwater infiltration. Mm. And those, all those tides that are washing onto the soil aren't making that any better. But that's, that's a thing that's just there because you're living on a giant sandbar and you, know, you already extract what water you have off of the Floridian land, leaving essentially gaps you know, little pores and all the soil and stuff that normally holds your water in your aquifer are going to be filled in by whatever is in the area. And it just draws it in from the oceans. So oh. not only do you have too much in the form of rain and flooding, but you're not, you can't necessarily drink it. And you also have the storm surge thing coming at you, plus all the, all the hurricane hazards. And so, you know, you've got water, you don't have water all at the same time, and you've got problems relating around all of it. And uh, it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a Florida person, I guess. It perhaps. sounds like we're beating up on Florida today. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> no. Well, let's let's move on. Let's we can do a, we can do a Coleridge Coleridge um, Coleridge callback for our literary friends. Water, water everywhere, and nary a drop to drink. Rhyme right. Yeah, don't Mar forget about Mar the sinkholes in Florida because they're uh, built on limestone, right? <laughs> yep. Right. Yep, yep, that's very true. Before, it sounds yep. like you're going to pivot here. Let me do a quick temperature gauge of the room. I just want to get a quick vote vote and a kind of a up reset the room, as they say. Okay, um, but just for our listeners, let's just do a quick vote. Who on this panel thinks that uh, man-made climate change is a serious problem that's happening right now? Bert? I, I guess, although when we're when we're looking at so many years... Is it man-made or not? I guess bottom line is I don't care. Bad stuff is happening. If the car is driving okay. over the edge of the cliff, I don't care if it's if it's the steering or the tires or whatever. Right. Something bad is happening. So you so you're like practical sense. It doesn't matter who's to quote unquote blame, as we've been saying. It doesn't matter who's to blame. We've got a problem. We should look into fixing it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So Nick, what do you think, real quick? Well, anthropogenic. Um, my big thing is I'm a scientist, so I hate the fact that the debate is completely over on any of those. So I'm going to say debate that all day long, but like Bert, it doesn't matter. We all have to deal with it. So the idea, I mean, the idea of climate change for me is, or environmental responsibility is more about reserving the resources and taking care of the resources that we as a species still kind of need on this planet. So do the right things because we depend on it, not because you're worried the globe is going to go up a half degree you know in, in average temperature over any given year so the debate's not over mm -hmm. and it, it, but also maybe the debate doesn't really matter who's who's at fault we're all at fault honestly i think a lot of people think that because then if we have somebody to blame there's some theoretical chance of us what correcting our issues which is complete bs if you ask me if the train's already going down this track now if it is our fault we can't stop it so it doesn't matter again right. Going back to the, it doesn't matter. Right. But hey, like, let, let's let's be real about this. Be scientific and continue the debate because that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Al, Al, what do you think? Well, I I think it's a combination of everything. The Earth heats up and cools down over you know over time, um, but also there's a lot of man-made things going on. You know, we didn't even talk about the Pacific Northwest die off in the ocean that's been happening recently that's mm -hmm. really massive i mean it's just really sad um mm -hmm. you know i uh i subscribe to national geographic and i see the extinction of a lot of animals um which is completely man-made um and so i think uh it's a combination of us not taking care of our resources as man and just the natural um, 
life cycle of earth heating up and cooling down. So I, I think it's a combination and we can debate all we want about whose fault it is, but I don't think that's really productive. And so I'm yeah. agreeing with everyone basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Hey Bertram. And what do you think Bertram? Yeah, I think I, I agree. Basically long story short, I agree with, with, with everyone. It doesn't matter. Like, doesn't matter who's right or wrong and, and to what extent we can debate, like to what extent it's, it's all mankind caused, but we've clearly got some issues we need to, um, to hash out now and some changes. But I just figure like uh, from an a priori sense, like just from a completely intellectual standpoint, if we're pumping, if, 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 if there have never been mil trillions of pounds of chlor of CFCs being pumped in the atmosphere by all the factories, if there have never been that except for the past 50 years or 100 years, do you think that might have an issue on the, uh, the, on the ozone layer and, the, and, the, and the, 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 um, the delicate balance that we have here with our ecosphere? I, I would say it probably does have an, an impact. So I would say there probably is some. some and, and, and by the way, because we're having this problem, why not just play it safe? You know, and, and yeah. cut everything down, and we might we might we all may might make a little le less money, um, but we'll probably feel better knowing that we're doing all we can. Uh, and so it, again, it's it's kind of a the kind of part of the same argument. Well, who knows how much of the cause is? If I had to bet on it, I bet we are hurting the atmosphere because you, you see some of these documentaries. They're like horror stories about how people are what people are able to dump into the oceans and what people are able to dump into our water supplies. And like you said. Uh, uh, animals going extinct so I, when i watch all those documentaries i can't help but think yeah i i think we're probably hurting things rather than helping things so let's cut it down um but when it comes down to it let's just play it play the safe thing you know it's like yeah it's like drink and smoke all day and like never exercise and eat a bunch of junk food it's like listen i'm overweight do you think this might have something to do with it or am i just gonna blame everything else well i'm gonna i'm gonna play it safe and cut out those things just so i know that i'm you know in, in other words it's kind of intuitive that if you if you pump a bunch of crap which has never been pumped into our i mean we've how long has humans been around hundreds of thousands of years hundreds of years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So anyway. Well, you know, the, the time frame that you kind of look at it is the, is uh, important as well, because there, yeah. when uh, when the climate change concept sort of really started to take hold in the last 15 years or so, there was this idea that, you know, you can look at a graph of global temperatures and they've got it scaled way back historically through carbon dating and all kinds of things. So where you can see, OK, clearly there's some jump in this chart when we hit the Industrial Revolution. Like that's a pretty convincing argument when you see the jumps that, that you see. And you can see if you see a graphed line of temperatures versus the amount of CO2 pumping in there, there's a pretty significant correlation there. But you can say the same thing. Well, we're just not going to look at the Industrial Revolution forward. We're going to go way back and look beyond, you know, glacial eras like the Pleistocene, which, by the way, a lot of scientists still think we're kind of coming out of an ice age. So it could be that yeah. this is, in theory, the effect of mostly, or in some part for sure, yeah. just us coming out of an ice age and yeah. heading into a warmer world naturally. Exactly. Wow. That's what it's I was going to say. That's what I told I told you, Bert, the other day on the phone. I was like, you know, when, when we were when I was at JHU APL for a couple of weeks, we got into this stuff. We were mostly dealing with like mag the magnetosphere, which is a, a thin band of uh, ions that come that protect us actually from the solar wind which is plasma and ions that are shot out constantly by the sun but we also looked at this on a glacial scale and if you look at the glacial on a glacial scale the graphs of average average uh, temperature on earth and stuff like that when we were studying that back in the 90s as much as i'm a proponent of like a greta greta thunberg the the young swedish girl who says you know, how dare you? You're ruining our planet for everyone. I love Greta Thunberg, and I think that we, we need to be making huge changes. But at the same time, Nick, like you said, if you look at on a glacial uh, time period, there are these rises and falls. And at the time when we were looking at it, the things we were seeing were consistent with uh, the natural fall and rise of those glacial um, periods. And like you said, coming out of the warm period. So, yep. you know. So, yeah, so the 
what what this would actually point up is that things, no matter what, we're just maybe naturally going to be warming, and there's not a lot we can do about it at this point because it's a it's a cycle. The world has warmed before uh, to a much higher degree than we are today. It has absolutely been warmer in the past in those interglacial periods of time, which were millions of years ago, of course. But um, you know, yeah, to some degree, this is just kind of probably supposed to happen. But we wow. are making it. We are very likely making it worse. And this, the problem for me is just that people they seem to focus on like what this means for the global temperatures and all these things. You got to focus on what is manifesting in reality out of this climate change thing. Think locally. You know, we've been talking about acid rain forever from forests or from, uh, you know, industrial plants polluting the atmosphere and leading to acid rain in the Midwest. You know, th these are all things that are th theoretically bad and bad for the environment and probably not great for the climate. But it's you got to focus on the local things where it's actually making an impact, not this, oh, man, we, you know, the, the temperature rose half a degree. This is what matters. These droughts, all of these things are happening. If you focus on those, you can probably get a point across much better than we got to do it because, you know, we don't want to get warmer. Yeah. Talk yeah. about what's really, really happening. Right. Yeah. If we look at, uh, you know, locally what's happening in Oregon, this, um, this forest fire, the bootleg forest fire, you know, they're talking about how we've been preventing fires from burning for years and years and years. And yeah. then all of a sudden we have this fire that's completely out of control. It's everywhere. They can't stop it. And it's burning up trees that normally wouldn't burn up because there's too much ground uh, fuel. And so uh, there's actually a, a really good story about how there's a nature conservatory in Southern Oregon that uh, wasn't burning up to the degree that the other forest was because they had prescribed burns on occasion and they had taken care of all the the land like it was supposed to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. So are we naturally getting in the way and doing things wrong when over time forest fires are natural and they need to happen, you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of preventing them from burning, just let them burn. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's right. That in back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, it was always fire bad, and uh, we, ha we uh, the Forest Service did everything they could to stop fires from burning, and that was thought to be a good thing. But what you're doing is you're preventing all of the undergrowth from burning. Uh, that could, uh, and then smaller trees grow up uh, and they don't burn. And meanwhile, these very, very large majestic trees um, can actually survive mm -hmm. small forest fires. Mm -hmm. And if you let the small forest fires burn, then it burns away all of the undergrowth that could potentially destroy the giant forests. So we're actually preventing that from happening. Yeah. And, and like, like, like Nick mentioned, there's certain seed pods that only open under extreme heat, kind of like popcorn. Um, there's also a whole animal ecosystems that f thrive amongst that, like charred, dead, uh, fallen trees and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really good for the land in general. All of that, you know, burnt material is, is exceptionally nutritious for plants. Um, so, you know, a lot of those lovely flowers, we all like to see the wildflowers and stuff really thrive in those environments. It's really actually fascinating to watch, you know, the forest recover uh, from these types of fires. But it's, a, it's not quite the recovery if, you know, you've completely burned the entire forest down, full crown fire, no trees standing. Like that's that's bad. I mean, Bert, to your point about the, uh, to the bootleg fire being, um, you know, this big, huge monstrosity. I was actually there um, about four and a half weeks ago, literally camping 10 miles west of where that bootleg fire started. I, I thought for a second, oh my God, I started a forest fire. I didn't, which is, whew. Uh, but I, I thought for a hot minute about that. But anyway, like what I saw down there, as far as the land use goes, it looked as it was in the national forest and it looked as if there had been these different, you know, projects to try to do some thinning of the forest, to do some kind of management. But what I ended up seeing was 
you know, nice big forest. There would be these plots an acre here, an acre there, a kind of a patchwork quilt, if you will, of clear cut. Like they were going to thin out these trees and make it a little better. But what ended up happening, it looked like they just put them into piles that were 30 or 40 feet tall. So you had all these, you know, 50 foot long logs in a pile 30 feet tall. So to me, I was looking at this landscape as a tinderbox, just like, man, there's just these piles of logs that in theory, you want them to pull them out. But I guess they just didn't get around to it. So you've got either piles of logs or you've got incredibly dense, you know, fairly virgin looking forest. Um, So it's just a tinderbox, you know, it's just a, a, I look like a failure of land use to me, just leaving all of this stuff sitting there. So there's not only fuel, but like they're actually making it into piles, which probably burns that much easier because you're organizing the fuel into easily burned stuff, you know? So it's just, wow. a, you know, there's just a lot of interesting land use happening or not happening for that matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, making giant campfires all over, <laughs> building fires all over the, the place. Hey, yep. tell me, let me run something by you and tell me, is am I wrong and, and why and that sort of thing. But if it gets warmed up, can we look maybe like, oh, say California looks more like Mexico, uh, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest, and uh, Minnesota, uh, Maine look more like California. Um, either like the South or what? What California sort of Mediterranean? The nor- Pacific Northwest looks like California, which is like a Mediterranean climate. Um, and let's say uh, Montana and um, uh, Wyoming, they or let's see what else. North Dakota, they look more like uh, Texas, uh, or and then uh, Maine and Vermont look more like um, South Carolina, <laughs> and then uh, Canada actually inherits our sort of tremendous cropland and and everything else. Everything just sort of shifts up. Is is that a wrong way of thinking about it? I think if you think about it holistically, that's essentially what happens. The problem is I think that we're, we're talking about it manifesting in pretty big extremes, like big extreme storms, extreme heat, that kind of thing. So I, I'm thinking that that probably also goes along with the winter season being relatively extreme too. And that doesn't necessarily preclude that from shortening a growing season, for example. So you might have really erratic weather that gives you, you know, frosts, really, really early. You might get some in September where you never did before. So it's possible that over, like, if you think about it holistically, everything will eventually warm, but how it kind of manifests in the weather and not the climate, you know, it looks a little more extreme. So it's kind of hard to tell. I I would say that long-term probably, but we're talking about tens of thousands of years to where, you know, truly the Northwest is looking like California in the interim, I, I think what we'll probably see again is those extremes. And it could honestly go either way. You know, it really depends where you are. Example, you know, the drought in the West is one extreme. On the East Coast, you have, you know, floods in the same extreme, you know, like in the same day, right? So it really depends where you are. It's super localized and it doesn't necessarily manifest in just a slightly longer season in the North and, you know, Hmm. A very long season in the south. Right. I, it could it be, really could, depends could, where. Could be, could be more complicated than that, and and more yeah. based on the actual local geography and climate patterns, hmm. because exactly. it is. I mean, we all know we all know how complicated meteorology meteorology is. Even though it's gotten so much better, though. Um, yeah, I, I can see what you're saying about how it's. It depends on the actual kind of local ecosystem and and climate and topology and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, wanna, it's, I want to ask a question for the group. Are um, natural disasters going up exponentially with all this climate change? Is that really, uh, are, are, should we pre- be prepared for that going into the future? Right. Yeah, we did, we did a deep dive on um, natural disasters of about three or f- I think maybe three mm-hmm. years ago. It was really interesting. I like got way into the data as far as where all the natural disasters happen, where the earthquakes happen, where the tornadoes. And there's some pretty, really interesting data when you dig way, way deep into actual just straight up numbers. Um, but I, that doesn't answer your question. So I'll let people answer your question if they can. Well, I would, I would think it would get 
everything except maybe earthquakes would be getting worse because you're getting more extremes. Things are just going to become more extreme. Like it may be getting warmer, but when you have a, it could be just like here in Oregon, it, we had a new high temperature by not just a few degrees, but what was it? At least 10 degrees. I think it was 107 was our previous high. And now it's, um, uh, it was 115, 117 degrees. And I know that when I started doing best places here in Portland, we could figure on seven days a year of 90 degree weather. Well, <laughs> I think this last week is, or this week coming up, we're going to have seven degrees, seven days of 90 degree weather. And I don't know how many days this year we're going to have, but I would imagine it's, um, maybe 30 days of, uh, well, probably 20, 20, 20, 25 days of 90 degree weather. So it's getting worse all, the, all over. So I would think things are, are just going to get worse. I'm sorry, Al, I forgot what your uh, question was. I was but. just talking about natural disasters. And, oh, yeah. and I, I think you answered that because um, you know, if you think about, you know, just turn over to the Midwest and so the West Coast, uh, tornadoes, are they happening a lot, a lot more frequently? I mean, I know that's your old stomping ground, Nick. Uh, yeah, the, the whole climate change thing in general is an amplifier of basically everything, uh, except for, you know, plate tectonic earthquake type things like, like Bert mentioned. Although I should say, Bert, that I, I did hear recently that people are actually at, beginning to ask that very question, whether climate change can affect, you know, things at a, at a physical earth type level like that. Mm. So, you know, we may get some more, I mean, we will eventually get some more information if it is nothing but, you know, I thought you were going to maybe. I thought you were going to mention maybe Oklahoma with their uh, with their cluster of uh, sort of mini quakes that have happened, uh, and uh, they think that has to do with um, fracking uh, yep. and other mm -hmm. other types of uh, extraction. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Pretty much anywhere you get extraction like that, um, you get earthquakes to follow or or some sort of outfall. Whether it's you know pumping fluids. Uh, that are protected by business laws as far as what they actually are. We're pumping those fluids into the earth at will to extract something else. That, that's that been a, a major catalyst, mostly because the chemicals they use are intended to make uh, the rocks lubricated. So God knows what that is, but it's, it's literally intended to move them so you can get things so, yeah, through so them. So it's actually inducing it. Uh, so it's yeah. it's kind of intentionally doing that. Um, yeah, so we, we definitely see that with fracking in particular. But to Al's point about Florida and sinkholes, anywhere you have limestone or anywhere you have a lot of water extraction in that kind of ge uh, geology, you're going to have sinkholes too, uh, for sure. You know, it's, it's uh, just one of those things. So uh, before we wrap this up, is there any place that's doing better? Is there any place that is more livable uh, that might sort of escape this that we know of? I mean, it, from my perspective, I, I think I still think the Northwest, despite our ridiculous drought right now, is one of the better places to be long term just because we have the most reliable at least until recently, across the country, one of the more reliable seasons as far as rain. And um, if you know, if we're thinking about drought and things like that, we're thinking about access to things that we normally have and like the least amount of disruption is for me what, what it kind of comes down to. And Pacific Northwest is still a good place to be for that. You know, yeah. it's, it's been a while and we're dealing with a drought, but winter comes back and it hasn't been that long since we've had some really solid winters in the area. So I still view that as long-term one of the better places to be. We have one of the more modest, more mild climates in general anyway. So the extremes in any sort of really mild place, not Florida, because that's not mild. It's still really hot there. Mild like Oregon, Washington, California. If you can get away from wildfires, the Northwest is a good place to be to try to mitigate all the other stuff that's happening. I would also think uh, along the Great Lakes as well. I mean, you, you have a tremendous water source. Um, yeah, I read an article recently that, that that actually talked exactly about with climate change, the Great Lakes region might become one of the more desirable places in the country. Actually, so yeah, yeah, point. 
there's five really big air conditioners out there in those lakes. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> winters are milder. And uh, if you need fresh water, there's, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to fall into the trap of saying, "Hey, there's, a, hey, that Colorado River, that's going to be around forever, <laughs> no, no problem there." Um, but uh, you know, uh, the Great Lakes are a tremendous body of water, and uh, so that could do a lot for um, keeping crops uh, watered and keeping the population. You know, they'd be a lot better position than, uh, say, the folks in Arizona, for instance. It all depends how we manage it. It's only been 50 years since we had the Cuyahoga River, which fall, which flows right through Cleveland into the, one of the Great Lakes there. Uh, it was on fire for yeah. chemicals being poured into it. So if we manage it well and we don't do things like that, we'll be okay. But there aren't a lot of places in history where you can find a river that caught on fire except for the Cuyahoga. So it really depends if, if we uh, allow industry to, to, to mess with it or not. Right. Well, we have the giant invasive Asian carp as well that uh, might get into the Great Lakes. So there's always something. There's a there's a lot of controversy and concern about zebra mussels in the Great Lakes too. Uh, right. They're they're taking over, wreaking a lot of havoc on the the wildlife there. There's there's a lot of problems everywhere. I'm not trying to be a total downer. I'm just way familiar with them. <laughs> Yeah, zebras are very muscular, um, and they will take over from the other horses. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> cool. um, okay. Yeah, so we should probably wrap it up. Um, yep. and, and we want to say, as always, uh, unless, Al, you have anything that you want to add at the end? You got anything, final thoughts or anything, Al? Uh, I like zebras, yeah. Yeah, zebras are good. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> very interesting animal. Um <laughs> But as always, please engage as a viewer. Please post comments on this YouTube video. Give us experiences of where you're living. Do you believe in climate change? Have you seen it where you are? Are you happily not suffering any effects from climate change? Because not only does it help us do our job better, which is important, but it also, the really the bottom line is to form a community that helps your other fellow users who might be thinking, about moving to an area like your like the one you live in. So yeah. that's a it's a big help. And the more people join in the community and leave comments and, and share their experiences, um, the more useful this whole enterprise is for all of us. So thank you for listening and thank you for leaving comments hopefully and please do subscribe. And I noticed on our um on our analytics that some of you are even pressing the bell button, which is the all notifications. So you're actually getting a, a notification in YouTube or via email. Anytime we post any video, then you're getting a notification and that helps you and it helps us. So thanks for oh, that's that. That's great. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for making Best Places a great resource. And uh, you're the reason why we work so hard. And so thanks for giving back. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Hey, so great. This is another week. We'll be seeing you soon, and uh, we have uh, some more great content for you later. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Stay cool this summer, and um, have a great time. Talk to also, you later. Bye-bye. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just add one more thing. Uh, Al's trivia question was a big hit a couple of weeks ago, and actually, people actually got the trivia question, which was Memphis, Tennessee. They got that in the premiere, during the premiere of the video, which is a, a time on YouTube when you set it up and it goes live right when you launch it, and there's a live chat, and it was pretty cool because people who were watching the video the first time it came out, the first hour it was out, actually got um, the correct answer, which was Memphis, Tennessee. And I'll add one... Um, one trivia question for us too. Once again, the offer is you get a free subscription for one year, one year. That's an eighty nine ninety nine value. If you just get this question, right. And Can I answer the question, Bertrand? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, because no, because I think everyone will know it, but it's near and dear to our heart. Cause it's been what we've talked, uh, talked about a lot this, this episode, but it's a simple one. It's just the deepest lake in the U S mm. and it, and oh, if, I know that. Yeah, and it's a really interesting thing. If you've ever been there, it's beautiful, deep blue, uh, deep blue water. It's, deep. It's, it's, yeah. it's, and very deep. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, very deep. It's, it's crazy. And, and if, for bonus points, you can answer uh, what the name of the island in the middle of the lake is called. It has a specific yeah. um, name. And, I, I've been on that island, by the way. Oh, wow. wow. That's cool. Nice. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty rare.
Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to tell us about that story later. Al, looking yeah, ne- forward to it. Next episode, Al will tell us the story. Sounds yeah. good. Who, cool. who knows whether it was illegal or not, but you don't have to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Great. Never know. Okay. Yeah. Great. Take care, everyone. Take right. care. Bye bye. Bye.